Hello, this is a weekly summary of interesting news in distributed systems and blockchain. My name is Thomas Bocek. Let's get right into it. The first article is a blog post from Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin. It's the following blog here. And in this blog, he explores the differences between layer two solutions and execution sharding in Ethereum, emphasizing their similar underlying technologies, yet distinct operational structures. Both approaches involve managing a large amount of data and computation utilizing ZK SNARK based on zero knowledge proofs for computational verification and data availability sampling, in short DAS, for data verification. However, while sharding integrates these processes into the protocol, layer two solutions achieve them through smart contracts, offering greater flexibility and innovation potential, but also presenting unique coordination challenges. Layer two solutions, despite needing better coordination, balance, independence, and shared security, which boosts creativity and cuts cost for non-financial users. However, they require improved infrastructure to keep Ethereum unified. And one effort to tackle these coordination issues is, for example, the Ethereum improvement proposal 7683 that introduces cross-chain intents and this proposal aims to make interactions and transactions between different layer two solutions smoother, improving the overall user experience and ensuring better interoperability within Ethereum network. And one interesting aspect is that not every transaction needs the highest security guarantees where um, he shows this picture here. This picture links to one of his uh, older posts, but I like this image a lot since currently we are here where almost all transactions are um, on a very high security level, but there are also other transactions that don't need that much security. For example, if there is a game score, which is not about money, for example, they need less security than some multi-million transactions on the left here. The next article is about email and SMTP, a topic we covered in lecture 12. And uh, in this article, it's the following article here. Here, the author finds an interesting bug in an email system. He describes that an email was sent to a customer and was missing a period in the body. So the email was the following here. There was no dot, but from another email, there should have been a dot. And uh, this only happens with specific recipients. Once the author started the investigation, he discovered that the missing period occurred because the email length exceeded the SMTP protocols limit, causing the period to be placed at the start of a new line. And we have also seen in the lecture here that I enter here a point which marks basically the end of an email. So the dot is a special character. And the SMTP client inserted an extra period at the beginning when the line uh, starting with the period to escape this special character. And then the SMTP server, when he receives the message, deletes this period because if there are further characters, it's known this is an escape character, so the dot can be removed. And that was also the bug. And by updating the code to handle this correctly, the bug was fixed. So the bug seems to be an improper escaping, and this is a common technique used in various computing contexts to handle special characters that might otherwise be misinterpreted. In SMTP, you double the dot. Similarly, in Bash and other shell environments, characters like backslashes are escaped by doubling. The issue, interestingly, popped up later on where it was much more severe and it's in the following message here. So we see here a dot as well, $27.00, dollars, 
but instead the customer gets something like that. And this is of course much worse, but the author knew how to fix it, fix it immediately. And then the email, further emails were sent correctly. The next article is a tutorial that's quite fascinating. It's the following one here. In lecture one, I was talking about hardware that can fail, for example, NAND disks, and I explained what SLC, MLC, TLC, and QLC, what this is in the context of NAND disks. And this tutorial shows how to make out of a QLC disk an SLC disk by modifying the firmware. That means in theory it should be more durable, but you also lose storage space as QLC stores 4 bits while SLC only stores 1 bit. So initially the 480 gigabyte SSD drive was transformed into a 120 gigabyte SSD drive, but with a much higher endurance. And this increased from 120 terabytes written to 4,000 terabytes written. Theoretically, this was not proven or tested. This was just theoretically calculated. And they also increased the speed. And this is all in the article here you can read up. However, one problem is with these claims here, the author used a leaked firmware tool that was posted on a Russian or Chinese forum. But still, I mean, if this could be done, if a uh, QLC SSD can be transformed in an SLC TLC that easily, then maybe in future a kernel driver could determine if uh, a disk should be an SLC or QLC disk and maybe even specify which cells, which percentages of cells should be SLC and QLC, but that's up for speculations. That would be cool to have. I'm not sure if it is feasible though. The last articles are about distributed systems and reminder that distributed systems can become complex. The first article, this is from May 16th, 2024, where Google Cloud Network issue caused outages and disruptions across various services due to a bug in the maintenance automation. And uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to shut down an unused virtual private cloud controller in a single Google Cloud Zone, but was incorrectly shut down in all zones where it was still in use. And uh, this affected creation of new VM instances, scaling operations, and network configurations. The incident lasted two hours and 48 minutes, affecting numerous products. But I really like those incident reports with all those details. You can read it up. I think it's quite fascinating. And another incident was with Microsoft affecting Microsoft Copilot, DuckDuckGo and ChatGPT's web search feature for five hours and the issue which impacted searches in Europe also disrupted services reliant on Bing's search result and API. This issue, which also impacted other search engines as DuckDuckGo, highlights that the web's infrastructure is dependent on a few big key players.